Shall we pray? Father in Jesus' name, we come before you. What a mighty God you are, El Shaddai. Thank you for moving in this room, oh Lord. Thank you for speaking to us as we could unpack that Matthew chapter 22 right now. I give each one, each and every single person in this room right now, oh Lord. It's not me speaking, but your Holy Spirit, oh God. You said, set a God over, our, over my mouth, as King David said, right now, you speak, oh Father, let your Holy Spirit, let your unction come to pass so that we just not hearers of the word, but doers of your word and understand what exactly you want to teach us through this wedding banquet, the parable of the wedding banquet. Help us, oh Father, in Jesus' name we receive, amen. I, I think it is super exciting to listen to each of your views. I'm uh, really thankful. <laughs> Thanks for that thoughts. Really appreciate that. Um, I just reminded um, my parents, uh, they don't miss one single wedding invitation that comes to them. I was like, I, I haven't seen right from their childhood time. They don't miss anyone giving invitation. They'll be the first one to go. But uh, uh, their children, all three of us, we are not like that. He would ask 300 questions. Why should we come for that wedding? <laughs> I don't know. Have you been through in your family like that? Where like you think, why? who is this aunt? Who is this friend? Why you need to be there? And sometimes we, we even ask those questions too much. And they say like, okay, you stay at home. Don't come. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Wedding invitations. All of us receive invitation. I think it's the second thing that comes to... I. Um, as we are studying this, the second thing that comes to my mind, how many times you ever ask your wedding host, what's the dress code? I I usually ask that, at least being in the West, you ask them, okay, what's, what's the dress code you want? Yeah, sometimes you don't want to be overdressed, sometimes you don't want to be underdressed. So you want to be very clear what's the dress code for that. But uh, as but some people don't even take that effort as well because they just do, okay, you need to accept me who I am and then you land as a, in your, uh, a, perhaps in the wrong clothes, in the wrong place. And sometimes people do that. To the beach, you go in the beach, beach court to the wedding, you go to the wedding court, right? <laughs> you swap both, you are lost. <laughs> you swap both, you are lost. And um, having said that, I just want to unpack this in the next few minutes about the parable of the wedding Banquet, I think uh, it's uh, some version, some translation calls it banquet. Some versions call it the wedding feast. But uh, we got a chance to listen to each one of you. I'm going to give you a little bit of context uh, behind this. Of course, this parable is only recorded by Matthew. And uh, if you happen to think like, okay, it's there in Mark and Luke, you think you will not find this parable. And Perhaps John doesn't have any parables, you know that. Now, coming to, okay, Chris, you're saying this, then I, I read in Luke 14, a parable, which is a great supper. So sometime when you don't, um, you may think on the top, on the top, the elements look same. Maybe you think, okay, this is the same parable. No way, that's not the same parable. It's a different parable. Okay, so only, so people tend to get confused because there's a very uh, clear, uh, the format goes with the king and with the, uh, with the son and how the wedding guests have been invited. Now let's go, I, I mean, we, if you're interested about Luke 14, I think we studied around that. Uh, you can find it. We studied uh, uh, give, give to give and give not to get. I think we spoke some uh, couple of uh, months back on that topic. But I want to talk into this uh, wedding. I want to give the title. I was just thinking, should we say the banquet is ready or what title should we give? But uh, the Holy Spirit, a uh, clear, clear read on this is like dress up or drop off. What? Dress up or drop off. That's the title I would like to give so that you'll remember and how it can make so, so much power to you. Okay. So let's go into this. I told you about the author. Now I want to talk to you about the audience. Who are the people? Who are the people who are listening? Who, who you know, this parable was spoken to someone. Who are these listeners? Who are the audience? Who, if you turn to this, you want to read this verse 45 of chapter 21. I'm there. I can read. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. 
So Matthew chapter 22, 22 to 1 to 14 is the parable where we say Jesus spoke to them again in parables. The key word is again. So this parable is a part of three parables. It's not one parable of a kind. And the people who are receiving, it's not the disciples alone. Disciples were there. But of course, it is the chief priests, all the big people in the town, all the big people, all the big Jews you find, all the key people were there. And he is talking to chief priests, Pharisees, and all the top-notch people there are listening to this parable. So it's not one parable, but a part of the three parables. If you look at, there are two parables before that, the parable of the two sons, parable of the tenants. And then last parable is Jesus is talking about this parable. Now, why this is very important, if you don't know who the audience is, you tend to make wrong interpretation. If you can, because this wedding parable can be misinterpreted in so many ways. Nobody wants to study this because this is a little bit dicey. At the same time, it's a little scary. <laughs> so people don't want to study that. So I want you to know, understand this was the people who were listening to this particular audience. I mean, the people who were listening to this particular parable. Now let's get into uh, author, audience, and now who, what is the time, the age, or what is happening at that time? If you miss that point, you miss the entire thing. Now this parable occurs when? This is the last week of the Savior. It's a passion week. Another few days, another 24, maybe 48 hours, Monday, Thursday, then comes Good Friday, then comes your Jesus crucifixion. You get what I'm saying? And uh, so it's a very last week, last week of the whole segment happening. So it's not something, if you miss this background, you'll miss everything. So I want you to understand this whole sequence happens through the Passion Week. What makes me say that? You can say when Jesus triumphant entry, which day it happened? Which day it happened? It happened on a Sunday. On Sunday. Yeah. It's a, you, we, we kind of go through it as a Palm Sunday these days, right? And then, and what happens on Monday? So Jesus is completely lock, stock and barrel in Jerusalem, right? For a, before the week. And he's come, come there alongside a lot of people for the Passover celebration. And only we know that he is a Passover lamb. Everybody is thinking the Passover celebration is going to take place. And now Monday, what happens? If, uh, I mean, I had a chance to teach on the fig tree sometime back and uh, you'll find the incident of fig tree, probably Jesus cursed the fig tree on a Monday and then he goes into the temple and then he cleans up the temple. The temple cleansing is happening on the, he, you know, the, he finds some sellers, people unruly, uh, you know, selling things. He People make it like a commercial marketplace or a, or a, thoroughfare people using the temple as a thoroughfare you can go and find a shortcut into the city it was doing people were misusing the place right so this happened on monday now look at the culmination and background already the chief priests the pharisees the sadducees are already angry with him are already angry with him and the culmination on tuesday where you find this is this incident happens on a tuesday when because you will see in the in uh, Luke, where people, uh, where Peter will say, Lord, the, the fig tree which you cursed, look at that, it's withered. Now, that's Tuesday morning. Now, you Jesus goes to the temple again, teaching the parables. So the schedule in the pa Passion Week is so interesting. All through the morning, Jesus does teaching, and most of his teaching goes at the temple. And the whole city of Jerusalem is so busy because across nations, people come to celebrate the Passover. So people either stay in their friend's house, family's house, but most of the people even put like small, small tents and they stay in the Mount Olives. So Jesus was spending his time in Mount Olives or either he traveled back to Bethany, you know, whose house is in Bethany, Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And it's his favorite spot. And he goes in the nights and then he comes back in the morning along with his fleet of disciples. Now, why all this is very important? You need to understand the context. The context of interpretation is very important. And thirdly, I want to tell you, not only the age, the parable talks. Parable is, what is a parable? It's short story, which gives you, uh, Jesus just places a story on what he sees. 
what he sees, whether it's a parable of the salt or parable of the light. It's not something what is not unseen. He, when he talks about the weeds, the seed, all that we studied, it's we he talks about what he sees. So it's more from the context. It's a, in Palestine, what exactly is seen? He takes that as an analogy. Now, parable leaves you with deep understanding. Either you can go concur with it or either you can get more confused with it. <laughs> like in our discussion we had right now, right? You can either say, oh my God, my eyes got open or you can get like, oh my God, I got blindfolded. What is he trying to say? Now, that's what the parable, it's like you need a window to understand. And for me, I would just suggest if you need to understand a parable, you need to understand the context, especially the cultural context. Here, it's a wedding banquet. If, you, if you're from Asia and other part of North America, you will understand wedding. The concept of wedding is different. But if you need to understand this wedding banquet, I want you to travel to a Palestinian wedding. I don't know how many Jewish wedding you had a chance to be part of, but that's very, very important for us to understand. If you don't, if you don't know about the Palestinian wedding, you are lost because you can't understand what is he trying to do? Why is he trying to do? So let's travel there a bit. And I want to help you with that kind of uh, background. I want to talk to you about three three perspectives one uh, on the wedding the first one is the wedding banquet okay the second is the wedding welcome then the third is the wedding clothes let me repeat wedding banquet wedding welcome wedding clothes but uh, before we could go into that i want to give you some if somebody going to read this parable on a shallow level I tried to say this to uh, my dear and I was telling her, my little one, I told her about this parable and she said, don't you think it's so unfair just because you don't, uh, uh, I invite you, I don't come, I turned down the in invitation. You come and burn my city. It's so unfair. You burn my house for that if I don't, if I say no to the invitation. I felt that was a very logical question. That was one. Second question was, if I don't wear a cloth, the proper attire you want me to, you'll throw me out? Is this a thing? So what kind of God are we worshipping? Can you get that? That was the question. Now, sometimes people who do a shallow reading, they can get a, they get to interpret what is God doing here? What? What is God's character? The proportionality of judgment. For saying no to an invitation, will, I, will my city get burned? For saying, like, I'm not dress up, should I drop off? Or what, what kind of treatment will I be? The end outcome is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, my God, this is terrifying. This is unfair. <laughs> That's a proportionality of the... But I want to, in, want to give another deeper sense. If you get to read that as a shallow, you may think, oh, my God, this is not the right way, proportion of uh, judgment being given. But God is slow to anger, abounding in love, full of compassion, and his tender mercies are over all his works. That's what King David says. Let me let me unpack this so that you'll know that God is good and he's a good, good father. And secondly, uh, it is not only the proportional, uh, proportional behavior of the father, but also you will also think like, what about these people? The reaction of the guest as well. Even the guests were really, they killed the people who came, the, they killed the servants. What, why, why are you looking at me like that? I can tell you. Where did they say they killed the people who came to them? Verse 4, 22 verse 4. Then he sent some more guest servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner. Okay. Now, what did they do? Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off. Verse 6, the rest seized his servants and mistreated and they killed him. Even murder happened. So I feel the guests were also overreacting, not just the host. <laughs> okay. So you can also see that everything is so proportionally very, very heavy, or very high. Okay. I'm looking at the time. So let's get into the three parts, which is wedding banquet, wedding welcome and wedding clothes. Now let's get into wedding banquet first. 
now if you need to understand i think if you have a friend uh, uh, a palestinian wedding would be nice to start with so you will know what it is so most of the time it's not like an ordinary wedding which is happening these days you see wedding happening in a park and a beach and then they finish the wedding in a matter of half a day or in a matter of one hour that's not like this this is a great great banquet it's pretty serious it is luxurious it can spread for like 7 days 7 days feasting 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 non stop so it's not an ordinary stuff so people plan for this several several months before for sometimes they are very very rich they do the entire 7 days sometimes people do it for for a short amount like 3 or based on the wealth and the power they have but this particular post they say he's talking about a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son so it is like seems like the wedding king had only one son and he wants to do it big he's talking about that now i want you to understand about this wedding banquet i told you the uh, certain weddings they keep on they have like not just food and feast they even involve in drinking right so they keep on drinking and by the end of the seventh day they are so tired they are so like a zombie because they are fully eating non stop eating and drinking maybe drinking wine i don't know what they were they were busy but all all weddings had that and it's a very large banquet it's a very large banquet so nobody can enter just like that unless you have a pass as reshma you said if uh, like megan's wedding unless somebody has an invitation you cannot uh be there for the wedding right you can't uh, be there without the invitation pass so in that in this wedding in this wedding banquet uh, the format is like this the invitations go first but there is always something called in the palestinian mode where we the culture what you see is there is a second invitation it goes you know what's a second invitation is like a confirmation these days you get a text message hey this two days we will get it um you know it's coming hope you are showing up at my son's wedding and all that but in those days not only the second invitation go maybe the servant goes and knocks at the door and say you going to come for the wedding you have been confirmed and sometimes the guest the servants go and even escort the guest so say 100 people or 500 people are called the king's servants go and escort the guest that that's the level of um, you know interaction it's very very high and not only that i want you to understand there is someone called governor the king has a governor of the feast so he is like a complete uh, pr person who kind of manages the entire feast end to end so you kind of take you know even the food arrangement you have like 25 items there's something called taste agent they come and taste the food is this the food is like as per the class and the drink the the drink quality of the drink how is it and music music is common entertainment is common you remember then uh, in samson being part of the feast how he plays riddles he plays riddles right in all those feast the philistines remember so it is very very clear clear hey, the wedding banquet is not an easy stuff it's completely organized with a governor in place who's try to look at each part of the entire sequence of the wedding but by the way what is jesus trying to say what's the analogy here the analogy he is saying here keep in mind he's talking to the chief priest he's who are the listeners you i told you who are the listeners now he's talking about the father of course a father kingdom the kingdom of heaven is like a king the king is like the father god and he is prepared a wedding banquet for his son and his son is of course indicating jesus so it is the wedding of jesus so lena you ask the bride is there where is the bridegroom the bridegroom the bridegroom is there who is the bride the bride is the church the bride is you and me who are who are made ready for the we are made ready to see the see the bridegroom he is the bridegroom okay now coming to the question so there is analogy is very clear there is this king father god inviting sending his son and his son is like saying i'm you know this is a wedding taking place but i have a very special invitation 
Now, you and me were not the invitation first. Let's not forget that. You and me are not the invitation. The invitation goes to number one, the priority is to very, very deserving people. According to the king here, the king already had a list in his mind. You know what? Look at that. He sent his servants to those who had been invited, verse three, to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So who are those people? Before you and me could be invited, it is the people or the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was this priority guest. Who's the priority guest? Jesus gave, came to save them and Jesus came as the priority guest. You may say like, you know, what makes you say that? Let's turn a bit into Acts, the book of Acts. So you and me are not priority guests at the first out onset. Turn with me to Acts chapter three. You want to read 26? Acts chapter 3, 26. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Look at the word first. First to you. To who? To the Jewish people. And not only Peter saying that, you want to uh, learn from Romans, which Paul says as well. Because Paul worked more among Gentiles, right? Paul worked more among Gentiles. So you can see that Romans chapter 1 verse 16. You want to read that? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In uh, NIV, Amen. Amen. Everyone, see, it gives salvation to everyone who believes, and he puts the word first. I put a color there. First to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. So that's what the NIV New International Version would tell you. Why I'm saying the deserved guest, the people who in the list was because if you read that several several years back. You go. Let's travel to the Old Testament. God was asking, the people of Israel was asking for a king and God was upset. You know, God was upset that, why are you asking your king? I'm a king. And because they forced for a king, Saul came in. And then, you know how Saul turned out because it was their choice. And then God sent King David. But of course, they did not have, in the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, there were divisions. Their kings were not good. Their kings were not good. And when we went into then Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, you find that when the kings went after that came the prophets. And now the prophets and after the prophets came the priests, where the priests were like you find the chief priests and the Sadducees and Pharisees are uh, right now running the Jewish regime. And now he's Jesus is saying a parable. There is a king coming and he's going to take the whole control he is going to rule the world and it's not an easy thought for a jew to accept where you're saying you're going to take the authority from us and one more a, a king is going to come and take it right now why i'm trying to say that the deserved people or the audience of the first priority was for our fellow uh, israeli friends across nations right now Let's get to them. Now, they rejected, they say. They refused. The Bible says very clearly, they refused to come. And uh, some, I told you, they even you know murdered. They even killed the servants. And the king sent more people. In fact, verse uh, 7 says, he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Now, you may understand, why is this reaction? I want you to travel a bit of history. Then you'll understand how it is. Now, when Jesus is talking about this, Jesus is talking about what is going to happen because they not only refused him. Let's go. Let me give you some rejections what they did. They rejected whom? Before Jesus, who did they reject? They rejected John the Baptist, right? Prophets. They did not support. They rejected John the Baptist. Now, after Jesus, what happened? There's another man in Acts, uh, first few chapters, you'll find Stephen. He got, he got stoned. They rejected. He's a, he's another one who, who stood. They rejected. And then what happened? A little down, you can see in Acts chapter 12, 
the disciple of uh, Jesus, James, what happened? He was murdered. He's killed, right? So what I'm trying to say is Jesus is saying, you not only refuse me, you refuse so many people, whomever I sent after. Now, what is going to happen? If you turn to AD 70, the whole city of Jerusalem was burnt. A AD 70, there is a ruler, Jew a Roman Caesar, Titus Caesar, he led this uh, entire seizure of that particular city and the city of Jerusalem was burnt. And that's when the diaspora happened, right? All the Jews spread across the world, scattered across the world. So Jesus was saying, hey, you reject your city. This is what's going to happen to you. In a way, he's telling this through the parable. Now you got the background. Now, then what he says, you, re you rejected me. It's okay, but I'm going to send my servants. This banquet is ready. I'm going to send this inv invitation who do not deserve. And who are those people who do not deserve it? It's all the Gentiles. People, the non-Israelite people are the Gentiles, which is people like you and me. Who, you're not a Jew by race. We, we get this by purely by grace of God. And he gives us uh, entry pass to the wedding. Okay, you're on the street corner, you're on downtown, left, right, center, you're a homeless, you're a cripple, you can't move, you're, you're, you're an orphan, you're a widow, you're a broken, you don't have a family, you're in foster home, you're, in, you're rejected, you, you're a destitute. And I like that part where he says, look at that. Verse 10, so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people Look at the word, the bad. It's not only the good people got the invitation. Reshma, at least to the uh, to the king's wedding, UK wedding, only all the good people were invited, esteemed rank. But here it's all, my Bible says, even the bad people were invited. So he doesn't care. Anybody, I want to, the objective there is to fill the house. Verse 10. The bad as well as the good and the wedding hall was filled with guests. It's like fill as many into the ark. Noah's ark was there, my friend. What happened? God did not, he did not say like you have an eligibility, you have to be this thing. Get into the ark if you're ready. Come in. If you just believe, get in. As many, it can fill as many. But then people choose not to come in, right? Now let's go. We finish wedding banquet. I'm looking at the time. Wedding welcome. You need to understand what is a wedding welcome. I, I really feel their Palestinian wedding welcome is so, so sublime. I really like it. And to understand this better, turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 will give you a way how a Palestinian welcome is. It's not a very ordinary welcome. Today, we maybe in the West, they just give a handshake and then they say, hey, hey please take your seat or something like that. Or they will direct you to a charter and say, you need to find your table and sit. That's a maximum they do as a hospitality gesture. And uh, maybe in Asia, it's a different way you do. But uh, uh, Luke chapter 7 is completely different. I want you to understand what kind of guest welcome they receive. Luke chapter 7 verse 45, where Jesus talks about a welcome. You want to read that? 745. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. So you, if you're a guest, you cannot miss her. If you're the welcome, the welcome in a Palestinian wedding, it cannot be without a kiss. In Metilo, who comes, they get a kiss. Okay, you get a kiss to get in, welcome with a kiss, and then you get what? And not only that, you your feet are washed. Feet washing is very important. Feet washing is very important because, and especially these people are from dusty, dirty road. <laughs> All people straight away from the road. And they're given like a, maybe sometimes a wash as well, but feet washing is more important. And not only feet washing, the Pharisees' tradition is hand washing. They spend a lot of ritual time on hand washing. And in fact, Jesus speaks in some other context. You spend on so much on the outside, but not on the inside, right? So they spend a lot of time on the hand washing as well. What about the head? This lady who anoints with his hair and tries to 
clean up with a you know jesus feet with their head and he's talking about anointing the they literally give an anointing on the oil on the head sometimes men has long beards right so they are, the beard is anointed as well and not only that your feet your clothes completely drenched <laughs> completely drenched and not only that they get a i saw a picture how is the wedding you know the guests are seated right they get a wreath as well so they get a head like a wreath placed on them so you if you're a guest the host has to do all this come on this is host job if the host is going to welcome you he has not to not like the uk wedding reshma just send the invitation and come in but you need to tell okay i'm going to give you the wreath you need to wear the wreath and a set of and the clothes it's not that you say i, I okay it's formal casuals and all that you can just put it on your note but this wedding is very clean and clear the clothes also provided by the host right the the it's not and uh, i think shubha to answer your question it's not the uh, it's not the preparation or the clothes have to be made by the guest but the host prepares the clothes it's not you need not go and say oh my god i need to stitch my clothes i need to get this no the, it's already ready for you 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 know what's the job the the responsibility for the guest is just to take it just to enjoy it just wear it just be there just show up dress up show up that's it dress up show up that's all now another thing what's the wedding welcome the guests uh, the host and the guests together they make a prayer of blessing on the food on every food imagine you are having the feast running for 7 days amount of prayer process in the ritual they do is so much they give lot of we just say a small grace these days but then it's a very 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 stipulated sense of blessing and by the way they have like if you are most honored guest and you have a seating arrangement as well if you are the king who is closest to the king who is like the next closest third closest that kind of seating arrangement ranking order is also there so if all this has to be done the governor has to be in charge for all this say somebody throws up and says hey i promised you then i can't come now you see i'm sorry i can't come it's not a easy thing the whole ranking has to be done and sometimes you know why if you are so close to the so close to the king you are even sent portions of food portions of things whatever blessing is sent to your families i have seen in the west here people in asia i haven't seen much but here people if you bring home we give them guests for their families we bless them and we send them right but this is the palestinian welcome i if you can understand the welcome is not an easy process it's very very laborious process so you can't afford to miss and jesus talking about it in luke chapter 7 where he said you did not you did not look at that how many times he say you did not verse 45 verse 44 luke 7 44 you did not give me any water you did not give me a kiss verse 46 you did not put oil I mean, look at that you did not you did not four times he talks about that so it's very very important on the wedding welcome you may think why am i saying so much on the wedding welcome if you don't understand that this wedding welcome is for all is not for uh, special people alone salvation is for all it's for everyone anybody coming into the bus get into the bus get into the bus get it's purely by grace you don't need to do anything tell me what did you and me do to get this wedding pass nothing right and it's not your righteousness our righteousness is like filthy rags if you because that's what the bible says your right your uh, you and me if we try to do okay i need to be too good then i will get invited no it's not you being too good even the bad people are invited so it's for everyone it's free free for all free free please come in so jesus is free for all give it to anybody and everybody don't hesitate and it's for all and it's for many the target is to give bring many into the room fill them you need not do anything it just believe that righteousness is all given by jesus and it's there in the cross 
And that's the message he's trying to say. The welcome is very, very liberal, very luxurious. Nothing you can eat, not do. If somebody in this room says like, oh my God, I have to do all this. No, we need not do anything. You're invited already. But let's get into the wedding clothes. What is this wedding clothes? Sometimes you might think like, right? What is this wedding clothes all about? And why is this king behaving like that? Once you get the wedding paw, uh, the pass, right? When you get the, when you say, I am there, going to be there for the pass, the wedding part, you know, participate. And I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there to show up. It means you're a subject. You say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm here to subject, subject myself into your kingdom. It's a kingdom living. It's not an ordinary living. It's not like as I like, but as my king likes to, wants me to live. As my king wants me to live. So before you could accept that's a different thing, you led a life, street life. We all led a street life, right? Street life, whatever hairy life or whatever your life we led. But there is something called kingdom living. And that's what wedding clothes is all about. Let me travel there a bit and then you will understand how important is this wedding wedding garments. You want to read that passage, what, he's, what, what did the king say? Verse 11? Verse 11, Matthew chapter 22. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? Now look at the way how friend. he calls. How he calls friend. him. So friend. that means you don't call anybody friend. There is a relationship. The king has a relationship with this person. This is a very exclusive or a very, very special title given, right? You, you see the movement moving from a general invitation to something called a relational invitation. You see the from a universal invitation to something very personal. Kingdom living is very personal. The shepherd knows the sheep by name. What? The shepherd knows the sheep by name. So he will, he knows who is sitting in which table, who is who, who is who, what is who, and every kind of detail he knows. That's what I'm saying. It's a very personal relationship. It's a very personal invitation. Now, if you look at the whole concept, it is, a, it is not only responsibility to, be, to lead a kingdom life. The responsibilities is not only with the host, it's also with the guest. The guest is no more an ordinary guest, but it's a, he's a subject who has agreed. He agreed, right? He agreed to say, I will be there for the wedding. He agreed to be there for the wedding. And so it means it's an agreement that he said, I'm going to be there and fulfill all the requirements which is required in the kingdom. Now, sometimes we wonder, what is that all the requirements he asked? Now, this guy did the washing for him, cleaning for him, everything for him. And he's just saying, hey, I gave you a set of clothes. Why don't you just wear that and come? Now, you need to understand, in those days, if somebody doesn't wear a wedding clothes and come, uh, Lena, you were talking about it. It's an insult to the king. The first question they ask you is like, say, 100 people see, seated up and one is not wearing, the king could spot it. And the king is saying, and even everybody would have spotted, hey, where's your clothes, man? Where, where did, why didn't you wear this? Where's your wreath? Where's this? I'm sure he would have answered the question. They gave it to you as well, right? Where is yours? They gave it to you as well. Where is yours? I don't know whether you go to a wedding and you find sometime when you're in an odd dress, people come and ask you, right? Are you okay? You didn't know about it? You didn't know? All of them are in violet and you are in some <laughs> some other shade, you're gone. So you you ask them, You people ask you that. So it's not only the king spotting, I'm sure the governor spotted, his co-friends spotted, everybody spotted. You know what? He had the clothes. He had the clothes, but yet he did not. So it's not that he did not have it. He had the clothes. He asked, that's why the man's reaction, what is the man's reaction? I want you to read that. Uh, uh, Jesse, what is the man's reaction? And, there? and he was speechless. Then the king said to the, he was speechless. He was speechless. He don't have an answer. 
I don't know how many of the time when you don't have an answer, you don't you don't know what to answer because it's you know it. Um, you're the reason. Here, I, I there is a phrase commonly used. I see in West people use this. For some reason, it did not happen. They'll say, I don't know whether you've heard this word. You don't hear this much in the other countries. Here you say, for some reason, it did not happen. You, I mean, I hear it at work and other places. Well, what is that some reason? You're the reason. Have you seen that? Some, for some reason, it did not happen. Or oh, some reason it did not happen. What's the reason? You're the reason. So people try to get escape behind that. And then they don't want to talk about it. And here, this man was speechless and he did and he still think okay it's not mine it's not a big problem right it's not a big problem but the king asks that question and he immediately comes with a straight judgment straight judgment but i let me go into the clothes a bit so you'll understand what is clothes in the bible what exactly he's trying to talk now when you are trying to say he's talking about wedding clothes he asks how did you get in here without wedding clothes so even to get in there, like Alina, where you're saying, when you go to the queue, the entry pass, maybe today we have electronic scanning. Without that, you can't even get in. Now, this guy managed to manage to even cross that level, right? He managed to cross. So it is talking about, turn with me to Revelations 19.8. If you want to be part of a wedding, the wedding with the king, you need to have this, I would call the, Fine linen attire or fine linen. What is this fine linen? Nineteen eight Revelations nineteen eight. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. Ah, uh, go on. Next verse. Uh, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, "Write yeah, this." Fine linen. Blessed or it's okay. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So it says fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Little two verses above, verse 7 of Revelations chapter 9. Let us, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her is, has, has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. So this is the wedding clothes he's talking about. He's talking about the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride. Who are the bride? You and me. You and me, if you need to be ready, the dress attire for that is fine linen. What is fine linen? The answer is there. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So it's righteous acts. It means acts means what? It's a doing word. It's a doing word. It's not I'm, I'm thinking righteous, feeling righteous, but doing righteous. Let me explain. Righteous acts. So it means that it's not just thinking, thinking righteous or feeling righteous, but doing. It's an action word. It's a doing word. It, that is why it's a verb. Okay. Now, uh, to make it very simple, if you want to talk to your children on what is righteousness, I was just saying the other day, they, when people go to he head on to school these days, new school and new things, there's a lot of four letter word they teach you which is not right for you. But maybe you want to re learn the four letter word, which you need to, which is for the fine linen, H-O-L-Y. That's it. H-O-L-Y. That's a four letter word you want to be. And that's what fine linen is talking about. Let me explain to you. I don't have time, but uh, you can read even Isaiah 61.10, where he's talking about garments of salvation and robe of righteousness. So righteousness is something, it's like a daily attire. You can't afford to miss it. You can't afford to miss it. In fact, I really like this fine linen coming is like a mandate where, where, where Father God insists that. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 39 and verse 27. Jesse, you want to read that? Exodus chapter 39, verse 27. 39, verse 27. Yeah. They also made the tunics woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons and the turban of fine linen and the headdresses of fine linen and the linen undergarments of fine twisted linen and the sash of fine twisted linen and of blue 
purple and crimson yarns embroidered with needlework as the lord has commanded moses now if you see how many times fine linen came there their only clothes starting starting level is only about fine linen it's all about fine linen whether tunic you know the tunic you whether it's a turban whether there is a cap whether there is a sash are you serious bible talks about undergarments yes seriously undergarments for fine linen now god is saying i'm your undergarments is very important to me your inside life is very important to me it's not fine linen on the outside but inside which is your secret life which is only known to you god is interested and that's why god is talking about your undergarments sometimes people come and ask you the bible is talking all nasty things here it's talking about all undergarments messy things and all that yes my bible talks about all undergarments in visit fine linen it talks about he's very particular he talks about five pieces of clothing there and he, and the starting point is fine linen and fine linen is nothing but its righteousness and uh, shubha you were talking about it's not our righteousness our righteousness is like filthy rags we cannot do anything about it but what righteousness what he is talking about i really like the context of romans romans 13 14 uh, if you're there in romans you, uh, to understand this fine linen in a simple language uh, is i would just give this verse in romans 13 14 it says clothe yourself rather oh. clothe yourself with the lord jesus okay and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh desires yeah so to say it clothe jesus after you're dressed up every day you put all your makeup and everything you're done just one question you need to ask just clothe jesus just clothe jesus because that's what it means when you want to check yourself you just think like am i clothing jesus am i clothing jesus and this guy who was rejected who was judged in fact he was thrown out he was thrown out from the very room because he did not sh- show up in clothing jesus that's all it means it's like rather clothe yourself with the lord jesus and do not think about how to gratify the flesh right now sometimes we think righteousness is not something what you have to do but you have to think what would jesus do am i doing what jesus want me to do on top of everything i dress up you just have to ask one question am i clothing putting on jesus in fact this is i like that word dress up with jesus you know put jesus on put jesus on put jesus on in everything and it may look very uh very very uh I, I sometimes you may feel a little squeezy but i tell you put jesus on wherever you go it could be at your work it could be at your family life it could be wherever am i putting jesus on that's what paul writes put jesus on that's the fine linen he's talking about and it's not second choice there's no choice over there christianity is not a book of uh, choices it's a very dichotomy there is no blurred lines no please think in gray no there's no gray here it's very very clear either you're in you're out either you're in or you're out now what makes me say that it's a consequence finally i want to tell you whether you have the clothes or you don't have the clothes whether wedding clothes on or not on if you're on you are in here if you are not wearing you are out what exactly it means and that's why people don't take this parable and study because it's very scary so hell is real what is the what makes me say it's a hell because he's saying that the king told the attendants verse 13 the tie him hand mm. and foot throw him outside mm, that's right in so hell there, is there be yeah, yeah. where where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth so how is hell let me give you three three uh, ecosystem in hell so at least we'll know allah no, no, no. yeah hell is real hell is real and of course hell is dark that's what he's saying it's very dark and people don't like to talk about that and then what you find in hell you find there is when do you people find gnash your teeth when do you gnash your teeth perhaps you have seen children do when they are very angry right angry yeah so people who are very angry people who people have vengeance people who have so much of uh, 
irritation or people who have animosity. That's what you will find. Imagine people in hell are full of gnashing of teeth. People are in anger. People are in rebellion over distress. And there is also weeping. What kind of weeping? Weeping of regret, or sorrow, pain. So it's not a nice place what he's talking about. Sometimes you may think, oh my God, the proportion, God could have made it easy. The king could have made it easy. Why did the king has to do the consequence? My friend, it's not one time. If the grace was given to all, everybody was given a chance and he had the clothes on, but he refused to wear it. And he didn't have a reason to, for no good reason. I don't know, for some reason, he didn't wear it. And now you understand and there is a con consequence for sure. And the consequence cannot be done. I have a feeling if only instead of being silent, he was speechless. The man was speechless. If only he has done today. There was a man on the cross. Even on the time he said, Lord, if it is your kingdom, he talks about the kingdom. And we are talking about kingdom living today, right? In this kingdom living, there was Jesus on the cross. And there was one thief who said like, can you take me into your kingdom? And that's what repentance means, right? The only way back, the only way back into the kingdom is repentance. It's not feeling sorry for sin, but sorry enough to stop sinning. It's not feeling sorry for sin, but sorry enough to stop sinning. And you say, Lord, I did this. I did this against you. And that's the only way reroute or coming back to the direction to, into the into the palace for into the feast it would be its repentance i just want to tell you uh if i want to close the emphasis if we think like you know one saved and all saved i'm saved so i'm good no it's not one saved all saved because bible says verse 14 many are invited but only few are chosen but only few are chosen and what does that mean the few is can be without righteousness. He's asking, how can you ever enter? How can you enter? You cannot enter. My friend, I want to tell you, uh, today when we want to share the gospel to our people, there are many more need to get into the bus. There are many more need to get into the ark. It's ready right now. It's open right now. But how are we bringing them into this? How are we trying to invite many people? Or are we only keeping the past to ourselves? Are we keeping the past to ourselves? Sometimes, you know, don't want to speak Jesus. When people ask you, hey, why are you so different from others? Why is your makeup so different from the rest of them? Why is your dress different from others? Why is your action different from others? Because I dress up Jesus. Because my robe is Jesus. It's, it says put on Jesus. After that, I cannot do that because my makeup has Jesus as well. So put on Jesus. And I think the most important way to bring people into the kingdom, of course, I wouldn't say don't just have to say about uh, fear mongering. It's not the way where we say, okay, there's a hell, please come. Of course, there is a hell. But tell them the power of Jesus. There, there is a clothes ready for him. There's somebody ready to wash there's somebody to anoint, somebody to keep the whole thing ready. The kit is ready. It's just you need to come in, dress up, or you drop off. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for speaking to us. What a powerful God, oh Lord. You've made this banquet ready for us. What a strong welcome you have. you're ready to do for us. And it's already underway. And you have given each one of us in this room that. But many a time we have been slack on our wedding clothes, oh Father. Some days it's on, some days we are a little bit tired. Sometimes we are relaxed or even apathetic. Father, forgive us, oh Lord. We don't want to miss. You said many are called, but few are chosen. We don't want to miss this, being part of this feast, oh Lord. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to understand this word and making it real in our life. And we want to not just be ready, us alone, but bring many into this, into this feast, O oh Lord, so that the feast is full and with all the people across this planet. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless. Any questions?